I want to thank Roger Scholey and Mike Stempner, Mary Leiden, uh, and friends of the uh, San Diego Architecture for asking me to talk. Sorry I'm not there in person. When this was originally organized, I thought it was on the 17th on Saturday, and, um, or I, I'm sorry, on uh, Monday, and uh, it's not. And uh, I had promised my son that we would go fishing on Saturday. So uh, we bought those tickets long ago, so we're going to be going fishing. But thanks for letting me do it this way. Uh, uh, as many of you know, I've written quite a bit, four books about the human connection in nature. And now with the pandemic, uh, people are start, starting to recognize much more than I uh, recall the importance of nature to their health. We no longer have to work hard to uh, encourage people to recognize that as a fact. Their mental health, their psychological health, their cognitive functioning, the ability to learn and create, all of that is affected by our connection to nature. It's gone from about 60 studies that I could comfortably uh, uh, cite in, in uh, 2005 when Last Child in the Woods was, was uh, published to now over a thousand studies. And they're all on the Children in Nature Network website, which if you go, it's all free. You can get uh, summaries of over a thousand studies. It's now become a growth industry, something that was pretty much ignored by the academic world. Um, the impact of nature on child development and on human development throughout our lives. With the pandemic, we looked outside. Suddenly there were birds outside. We were lonely. Those birds served to function. I wrote a piece for the uh, Los Angeles Times back in July about people were taking great solace uh, from the wildlife right outside uh, their window, if they were lucky enough to have a yard, or even if they didn't, even the most urban areas, they might look across the street at the windowsill and become fascinated with the raptor building a nest, and it made them feel less alone. During the pandemic, you saw wild animals walking down the middle of the city all over uh, the world, sometimes tigers and bears, and, and people got a little freaked out. The, but probably those animals, most of them, were already in the city. They didn't come in from outside. San Diego, there's been a lot of wildlife moving to the city as we've moved into their territory, but they've grown accustomed to us and certain kinds of animals uh, become easier, uh, find that easier to do. Raccoons and uh, coyotes, crows, um, the, um, uh, these are the animals that are attracted to the novel and the new. They're a little bit like techies. They're, they want the latest iPhone, so they're, not, they're comfortable with the new. Uh, this poses both problems and opportunities. I think it presents a really important opportunity to deal with the pandemic of human loneliness, which medical folks have been talking about for a long time, for decades now, and increasingly, uh, the studies show that the impact of human isolation is the same in terms of the associated diseases as smoking and obesity. Uh, this is literally killing people. The types of cities we build, the types of lives we lead, disconnected not only from nature, but from human beings as nature. And the terminology is tricky. We're part of nature. But uh, I think it disconnects us from our true nature as human beings. Uh, some people uh, blame this epidemic of human loneliness on Mark Zuckerberg. Can't blame everything on Mark, uh, but certainly antisocial media has a has played a role. Uh, but so is the, the design of cities. We take a walk, we are, we're told. Walk where? You won't run into a freeway. Uh, it's very difficult now in most neighborhoods to really take a real walk. Uh, obviously, there's been progress in that area because of new urbanism. Uh, but also our fear, fear of strangers, stranger danger, particularly about our kids. Uh, that has driven us indoors, out of community. Believe it or not, you have to go outside the front door in order to develop a sense of community, in order, in fact, to participate in democracy. You actually have to know your neighbors, and not just your human neighbors. We have to know the nature around us in order to make the right decisions, particularly now, in which almost all of our social problems are linked one way or another to the environmental challenges we face. Uh, I think that that human loneliness is rooted in an even deeper loneliness, which I write about in Our Wild Calling, which is species loneliness, not just as individuals, but as a species, we are 
uh, uh, feel disconnected from other life. We are deeply lonely as a species, increasingly so. Why else would we look for Bigfoot? Why else would we look for intelligent life on other planets when Stephen Hawking tells us it may not be a good idea to find that? It's because we're desperate to feel that we are not alone in the universe. Supposedly, that's what cities are for in part too, to help us not feel alone in the universe. So the question is, how do we reintegrate nature into our lives and why post-pandemic? One reason is the pandemic itself, the diseases themselves, which are almost always called they're zoonotic diseases. Uh, they are passed from animal to human, other animals to human beings and back and forth. Uh, biodiversity is a defense against that kind of, uh, against uh, those kinds of diseases. The more diverse the biology is in an area, most of the people who studied this say the less likely it is for human beings to be so vulnerable to these diseases. Uh, one of the things that is being promoted, and some of you in the health field will know about this, is uh, what is, um, uh, is called the One Health Movement in public health. The One Health Movement in public health holds that uh, you cannot treat people preventively in terms of health unless you also deal with the health of the wildlife, the life in that region, as well as the life of the planet itself. Uh, that's a big movement in public health, and it's very important, and there's very specific applications of that that we don't have time to get into that could apply to San Diego. Um, certainly, we're learning that urban and nature are not mutually exclusive, that we need both in the same places. Sometimes that's a difficult thing to deal with for some folks, and the new urbanist folks, I gave the keynote a few years ago to the Congress in the New Urbanism, and I found that some of those people didn't particularly like the idea of more nature in cities. And I realized after a while it's because they were associating it with the failed suburbs, which were supposedly set up to have us have more nature in our lives. That was one of the reasons for the suburban uh, design. It doesn't have to remain that way. We have to have suburbs and cities that are filled with nature, that are nature rich. And part of the reason for that is because it makes us healthier. The studies are astonishing in terms of those thousand studies that I mentioned, uh, the, the ones that show that um, uh, t symptoms of attention deficit disorder go down, uh, uh, mental health issues get better, physical health issues get better. It's a long list I won't go into, but we need more nature around us. It reduces stress. It makes some neighborhoods less violent to have more nature in it. And it's literally a life and death matter. Some of the recent studies have looked at, this, at, at neighborhoods that are not green compared to those that are green. And they've tried to look at this in a way that didn't just say that not green neighborhoods were poor neighborhoods. They looked at not green neighborhoods that were rich neighborhoods too. They looked across the board and what they found is that the the, the less green or the less nature there was in a neighborhood, the higher the rate was for preterm babies, for uh, uh, a, a list of uh, diseases and uh, conditions that shorten our lifespan, that literally the lifespan is, is less if you live without nature in your lives. So we really want healthy cities, both for human loneliness, but also for health we have to design them differently. Uh, some of you are already working on that. Biophilic design is one of the uh, leading uh, ideas, I think, in architecture, which holds that. It's based on E.O. Wilson's idea of biophilia, which is that uh, uh, human beings are hardwired to have an attraction for the rest of nature, an affiliation. When we don't get that enough, we don't do so well. Uh, biophilic design, as many of you know, weaves nature into the design of a workplace, a school, a neighborhood from the very beginning and then keeps it there. People who work in biophilically designed offices are more productive, sick time goes down, uh, uh, turnover gets better, creativity probably goes up. Uh, so how do we get there? Well, one thing I think you're already doing, many of you are working in biophilic architecture. We need a lot more of that. We need a a citywide discussion about how to increase that or a region-wide discussion. 
um, I'd like to see some charismatic ideas catch on. I like charismatic ideas more than I like charismatic people. One of them is the idea of a, building a homegrown national park. That's Doug Talmy's uh, idea. You should look up his, his books. Basically, he says that if we really care about climate change or biodiversity collapse, uh, we'll probably spend less money on Brazil and more money on our yards, change our yards, uh, school yards, our personal yards, etc., into uh, native species. And when we do that, it brings back the biodiversity of a region or can at least begin that process. Uh, and that can happen starting now in your yard, in his yard or her yard. Pretty soon you have uh, wildlife corridors going across the city and beyond the city. And he calls that the homegrown national park. Uh, I, I'd like to see us have a worldwide homegrown park. Uh, so you have kids in, in San Diego talking to kids via the internet in Sri Lanka and talking about the native plants that have been planted and the, the critters that are showing up that never you haven't seen before, but they're native to that region. Um, um, as I mentioned, we can have a One Health movement. Uh, we can, it seems to me, the region can join with organizations like Biophilic uh, Cities, which is out, out of North Carolina, uh, and also the Children Nature Network's uh, 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 the program that's in partnership with the National League of Cities. Of cities all over the country now are trying to decide how to become nature rich, not just uh, uh, a few parks, but how to weave nature into the whole city so it's everybody's healthier and everybody's happier. Um, uh, you can find out about that program on the Children Nature Network website, which is childrenandnature.org. Um, also, I think we have to value our bioregion more than we do. San Diego is not just the zoo and the beaches. Uh, and it's not just apple pie and julian. The whole region has a particular quality that we don't fully re appreciate as a region. Year after year, or time after time when this is tested, San Diego County, uh, this bioregion, which extends also into Baja a ways, is considered, this county is considered one of, and often the most biodiverse county in the lower 48 states. This is a a great place. The UN uh, recognizes this as a bio uh, region. It's a hot spot for biodiversity. What if we made that a, a, a feature? What if we marketed that, wove that into our uh, marketing DNA? Uh, what if we named it? I had lunch a long time ago with the head of, uh, uh, of the National, uh, of, of the San Diego uh, Natural History Museum um, and the, the prior uh, ahead of it. And he was wondering what the National Natural History Museum could do. Why not hold a contest and name this region? When you name something for its particular quality, you will value it more. If we value the biodiversity of this region, we will not destroy it as much. And again, have it part of our marketing plan for tourism and all of that. The San Diego is already a a, a focus of bird birders come here from all over the world. Uh, again, if we name it, maybe a Kumeyaay name or some other uh, name, Pandora maybe, uh, and make it part of the marketing plan. That would help us value nature in the post-pandemic world. Uh, and finally, I've been saying for a long time that uh, challenging cities around the country to decide to be the most, um, you know, America's finest city for children in nature. I challenge folks in San Diego to do that. Some cities are taking up that challenge through the, the, the um, project I mentioned, the Children Nature Network, the National League of Cities. Why couldn't San Diego take the lead on that and say, come up with five or 10 objectives to meet in two years? Number of trails created, number of pediatricians who are prescribing nature. Increasingly, pediatricians are doing that because they've seen the research. Um, uh, biophilic design, the number of buildings being designed, the number of schools have been redesigned or, re or created with biophilic design. Whatever those measures are, meet them in a couple of years. Then hold a big party in San Diego and say, and announce ourselves as America's finest city for children in nature. And if a mayor of some other city objects to that, that's good. That means there might be some co competition next time and we might 
spread that idea around the country. Why couldn't San Diego lead that effort? And I've gone over my time. I apologize. I'll stop now. Thank you. Bye.